Hello and welcome to another episode of the Wisdom of Friends podcast. Thank Thank you for tuning in. If this is your first time listening, then thanks for coming. This is a podcast where you get to learn more about your friends and community, their wisdom, their trials and tribulations, timeless insights and their secrets. Now, let's get into the show. Please welcome your host, Cal Aras. Hello folks, uh, this is your host Cal Ross and welcome to another episode of uh, Wisdom of Friends. I'm really excited to be introducing you to a good friend of mine. His name is Neil Chasen. Neil grew up in South Africa during the apartheid years. He was on the first multiracial sports team to represent the nation as a high school gymnast. He spent his university years at University of Washington and then went on to build a successful physical therapy practice, which he ran for 30 years. During that time, he taught at the University of Washington and around the nation and indeed the globe. He's a published author and he has produced the iPhone app called Pain Free Back, which Future Trends magazine rated as the future of healthcare. Now Neil is currently working as a commercial real estate broker after retiring from the field of physical therapy. He's also been a co-founder of Smart Metabolism and he's written a best-selling book called Total Conditioning for Golfers. And he's been a featured speaker at many educational forums like IDEA and ACE as well as other national and international venues, including in Canada, Australia, and England. He served as a member of the Board of Directors and Treasurer of the Washington State Physical Therapy Association for many years, and has been the Chairman of the Orthopedic Physical Therapy Special Interest Group in Western Washington. Neil and his family are residents of the Seattle area. Friends, in this episode, we talk about Neil's journey as an immigrant from South Africa to the United States and the choices he's made to go on to establish a successful business as a clinical physical therapist. And then reaching a point in his life where he was confronted with his own identity crisis, where he had to shut down his business and reinvent his career. And what did that take for him, the choices that he made, the decisions that he took, and the wisdom that he applied to really start leading a life that is inspiring and just simply amazing that serves as a role model for the community. He's been involved with a lot of community projects uh, like uh, the beekeeping at the University of Washington. This is a fascinating conversation, friends, and I hope you enjoy it. And without further ado, let's welcome the one and only Neil Chazen. Good evening, uh, Neil. Uh, Welcome to another episode of uh, Wisdom of Friends uh, show. I'm really excited that you took some time uh, to be on this program. And let me start off uh, with my first impressions of you. And this was uh, almost a year and a half ago when I was the head coach for the self-expression and leadership program in Seattle. And uh, you were part of that program. And one thing that stood out for me was the kind of projects that you had taken on. I know a lot of people had taken on projects that uh, was for the community, but your project really stood out, in my opinion, because it really was about environment and, uh, you know, it was about the beekeeping project. Project and I would like to get into that a little bit as we go along. Uh, but and then having met you and uh, after that having got to know you a little better and your story and I thought you're such a fascinating background that we should definitely have you on the show. So again, thank you for taking the time and welcome to the show. Well, thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Great, Neil. Uh, so one of the ways we start off our show is by asking our guest a very simple question. And that is, uh, what's your favorite quote or a philosophy that you live by, and how have you applied it to your life? I appreciate that. The The code or philosophy that I live by is to really show up as a contribution, and that's in every conversation that I have with everybody that I encounter. How can I contribute to that person's life? 
and then I try and find an action I can take that supports whatever it is that they're up to. And just by just by having that way of being puts me in a space of listening rather than sort of speaking to into them, but rather listening to who they are and what they're up to and, and what's important to them. No, that's so great. And uh, listening to your background a little bit and what I'm really fascinated about, and we talked about it briefly before uh, getting on the show here, is uh, that your aunt, you're born in South Africa, right? right and uh, right. your aunt uh, was the Minister of Prisons in the South African Parliament. Mm. And uh, so walk us through that story as to how did she influence you growing up and what was that like uh, growing up in South Africa during those times? Yeah, well, you know, <clears throat> I grew up during the apartheid era in South Africa. You know, when I was growing up, Nelson Mandela was in prison. Um, the laws of apartheid were being draconianly implemented. And... I really grew up as a privileged white person in black Africa. And, you know, we had servants and it, we, it was, it was, it was really like, I was really like the last colonialist, you know. So when I was actually born, South Africa was still an English colony. And then five years after I was born, South Africa became independent. And, but the, even though it was technically independent, the sort of, veneer of colonization still permeated the country so it was effectively i was the last colonialist and the impact of that was that when the black african movement the anc in particular started sort of agitating for freedom it was really against sort of a colonial ethos that they were sort of fighting at the same time during the 40s and 50s with the implementation of the Afrikaner government, they sort of became the force of sort of separation of state and separation of people and the implementation of apartheid. So while I was growing up, um, the country sort of, the white government country sort of shifted to the right. And my aunt was the sole progressive member of parliament you know when i was in high school for example and she, since she was such a long-standing parliamentarian she became the minister of prisons this is helen susman we're talking about and um, she was my father's first cousin and um i just remember when we became uh, eligible for green cards in the united states we went to have a conversation with her about, you know, is this a good time to leave? What do you think is going to happen? And she had a very dark view of what South Africa was prepared for. You know, she was inside the government. She could see what the military and the police were up to. And she felt like there was um, preparation being made for a all-out bloody civil war. Mm. And, you know, she said she can't leave, but she gets that we can and we should. And at the same time, you know, soon after we left, the negotiations between Mandela and de Klerk started and gradually, like if you read the book Invictus or see the movie, he gradually negotiates the freedom. Now, just to give you a sense of the heightened experience, at the time that I grew up, the African movement, the freedom movement was sort of progressing and a young leader named Steve Biko came to the fore and he was um he modeled himself on gandhi he was also south african uh he modeled himself on gandhi with a sort of non-violent protest and activism and the weekend that i left south africa he was murdered by the police arrested and tortured and murdered so that was kind of the temperament at the time it was a very volatile situation i was facing 10 years in the military um, I would have to have gone into the military for a, a stint and then had sort of camps every year for a period of five to ten years. So, you know, like my motivation for leaving was I wasn't prepared to defend white supremacy under any circumstances. And uh, I was planning to leave. I was a gymnast. Um, I represented South Africa in the first multiracial sports team that left the country. We went to Berlin and... 
<clears throat> I got to see in Berlin the protests, the anti-apartheid protests firsthand as the South African team marched into the Berlin Stadium. And um, at the same time, I became friends with some of the young black kids who were on the gymnastics team with me. And it was soon after that, like within a, within a year of that experience, that I was at a professional soccer match one afternoon. Highlands Park was the team. And after the game, we were walking across the field, and one of these gymnasts, these black gymnasts that I met on the trip to Germany, grabbed me and he said, hey, listen, we're going to burn the country starting tomorrow. Mm. And I was like very confused by that. I didn't sort of get the context of it. But the very next day, the Soweto riots started, Alexander Township started burning, and the country sort of felt like it was igniting into civil war. And at that time, we became eligible for green cards to the United States. And so we sort of activated that process. And within a year, we were here. Wow. And how old were you? I was 18. You were 18. So yeah. <clears throat> so that was the time that you came to the United States at that right. young age. Mm -hmm. Wow. So one question that um, obviously that's fantastic and it's an uh, amazing story there. And one of the things that I'm curious about is gr me coming from India, we have had an amazing influence of Gandhi and it still continues not only in India but across the globe. Right. And uh, what I'm curious about, Neil, is uh, how was Nelson Mandela's influence on you and some of uh, the younger generation during your childhood? What was that influence like? So keep in mind that, you know, from the white government's perspective, Nelson Mandela was imprisoned as a effectively a terrorist, right? He was a, he was a um, violent agitator. He was imprisoned in association with blowing up some radio towers. He was the lawyer on the, in the conversation, but that was sort of the essence of the kind of messages we got. I finished high school in South Africa and I went to university there while we were waiting for our green cards to come together. And while I was, in high, while I was at university, because I wasn't planning on graduating and the, the way the school system there worked was you would take classes for a year and then go from year to year. And since I wasn't going to finish the year, I wasn't going to get any credit. So I, instead, I just worked on a, a magazine called Crisis. Mm. And what that magazine was, um, it was a compilation of all the column inches from around the country that illuminated apartheid. Mm. So, you know, there might be a one inch column in a small town newspaper that says white farmer shoots black woman. But if you, if you had like page after page after page of that, you sort of get a picture like the country's like in big trouble. And it was about a 10 page magazine filled mm. with this kind of stuff. Mm. And I was involved in distribution of it. And the, the editors were arrested and disappeared. And when I, we had to go to the police station to get exit visas and when I went to get fingerprinted for that, they said to me, we know who you are. It's a good thing you're leaving. Mm. You know, it was like very, it was like very sort of um, scary in a way because wow. it was a police state, you know. Yeah. So our view of Mandela was that he was in prison as a terrorist, as a white South African. That was the view. Mm. But there was a sort of undercurrent of what they called um, Robben Island, which is where he was in prison. They mm. called it Mandela University. Mm. And so what would happen is young black activists would get arrested. They'd go to Mandela University. They'd get trained by the ANC who literally ran the, the prison. There's a, there, there was a – people don't realize this, but in the prison in Robben Island, Mandela and the leadership of the ANC who were all together created a soccer – club mm. and they formed a very formal organizational structure of the soccer club and they created a government of the club to practice being government wow so that when mandela was freed he had a whole structure of government to bring into government immediately that was formed by organizing the soccer club inside the prison so they, they actually were very forward thinking. That's uh, fascinating. So let me ask you this, and what I'm really curious about is, what did your parents do growing up, and how did that shape your life? So my, my dad was a business guy, and um, there's a lot of story around that, but he, he 
he ran dry cleaning factories and that sort of thing. When I was like 11 years old, the business went bankrupt and he shifted into a fundraising sort of role with an organization. My mom was a private practice physical therapist. Mm. And she, when she came here, she got her license, ended up being the chief of physical therapy at Harborview Medical Center. And her expertise was in the world of spinal cord injury, closed head injury, and sort of neurological rehabilitation. And so she was a huge influence in my life because I became a physical therapist mm -hmm. first out of, uh, as my first career choice, which is also funny because when I went to see the counselor at the University of Washington, the freshman counselor, she said, what are you interested in? And I said, well, I'm interested in computer science and I'm interested in sports medicine. Yeah. And she said, well, there's no jobs in computer science. And this was in 1977. So... You know, I might have been like one of the founders of Microsoft had I <laughs> stayed on. But uh, yeah, so I became a PT. Got it. Yeah. So so walk us through the journey. So you came on a uh, green card. Is that uh, correct yeah. in the United States? And yeah. you're roughly in your early 20s. Uh, I was 18. You were 18. Okay. Yeah. So what was that experience like coming from an environment like that uh, back in South Africa? Yeah. Uh, to Seattle was yeah. your uh, the first uh, landing? Absolutely, yeah. So you have to get that Johannesburg, where I grew up, is a big, dirty, ugly city with like no redeeming value whatsoever. It's just a it's a gold mining town. Mm. So you know it's a dirty city and it's a big city, and there's really nothing interesting about Johannesburg except it has a lot of trees, and the tension was very high. You know, when I left, you could hear machine gun fire at night. Police were everywhere. The Africans were sort of, you know, there's a lot of tension. Mm -hmm. And when I arrived in Seattle, I arrived on September the 4th of 1977. It was like one of these beautiful, clear sky, 80 degree days, you know. And Seattle's beautiful, you know, it's green and the water. And it's just, and the thing is, it was a holiday. I didn't know it was a holiday. But we arrived here, we went to my uncle's house. He lived. The reason we came to Seattle was we had family here. Well, he lived in Laurelhurst, which is a fancy neighborhood over in uh, Lake Washington. And we're driving through the neighborhood, and there's people out washing their cars and kids playing in the street. I just thought I had died and gone to heaven. It seemed like everybody was so relaxed here. And, you know, really, Seattle is very much a relaxed kind of town, you know. And coming here was just like dying and going to heaven. That's so great, and I totally agree with you regarding Seattle. It's uh, it's probably was something similar to as to what we have going on today. It's uh, 80 degrees, and yeah. uh, it's really beautiful outside, and absolutely so gorgeous. So uh, I understand you went to Utah State, and then you also went to University of Washington. So. Well, I started out at the University of Washington. I got my undergraduate degree there. Okay. And uh, out of school, I started a private practice immediately. And then about 10 years later, through an organization called the Ola Grimsby Institute, I did my master's degree in orthopedic manual therapy through Utah State Board of Regents and um, practiced as a sports medicine-oriented physical therapist in private practice for about 30 years. And um, through that time, you know, I taught at the university, I, I I'm published uh, author, I published in the medical literature, medical textbooks, I've, you know, produced videos and other things and, you know, I've toured around the world in the context of that field. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm looking at your bio and you have a fascinating bio. I mean, really a successful career. You were a co-founder of Smart Metabolism, and then you've also been a featured speaker at many educational forums across the globe. Uh, you've traveled to international venues, including Canada, Australia, England, to give your speeches. And then uh, you also served as a board of directors and uh, treasurer for the Washington State Physical Therapy Association for many years. And you're the chairman of the orthopedic physical therapy special interest group in Western Washington. Yeah. So... This is really an incredible background, and I know you've also written a book called Total Conditioning for Golfers, and I want to talk to you about that as well. And uh, what this brings up is uh, a question, Neil, and uh, as we have done many interviews in the past, one of the things or one of the trends that we have noticed about people who have been incredibly successful at whatever they have done, their 
career or the chosen profession is the fact that they've encountered some really hard, big hardships and challenges. And uh, oftentimes, uh, people would view that as a failure, but they had a different viewpoint. They used that as a stepping stone, and they used that adversity uh, to really shape their character. Mm. And so my question to you is, what were one of two uh, biggest challenges that you have faced in your life, and how did you overcome it, and what lessons were you able to take away from that to help you navigate life as yeah. you went forward? You know, that's a fair question. I mean, my the best training I had for business was my career as a successful gymnast. And, you know, you learn as a gymnast, like, first of all, you got to land on your feet. Secondly, you got to get up and, and get on the apparatus again when you fall off. Mm. You know, so that's kind of the the sort of tough skin that I have in the world of business has related to the fact that, you know, I get that knocks happen. I get that mistakes occur. I get that, you know, things don't go the way you want them to, but you still have to land on your feet. And I've always just had it that I land on my feet. Like I've just had it as a mindset. Mm. You know, um, I built a, a, a good practice and I worked successfully in it for 30 years and had some incredible highlights. You know, I consulted with the U.S. Olympic high performance team. I've been a consultant to the Seahawks and the Sounders and the Mariners and the Huskies. And I've traveled with USA Rugby and gone to the track and field world championships with athletes. And um, when healthcare reform occurred, I was totally for healthcare reform mm. and it killed my business. Mm. You know, we, we, we treated young athletes and we relied on their insurance to pay for their care. And when healthcare reform occurred, like their insurance no longer paid for their care. They had high wow. deductibles or they didn't have insurance. All of a sudden, just our business model didn't work. Mm. And it just wasn't possible to retool it. And I was faced with a choice at that point, you know. Um, I could either try and reorganize my professional experience in the world of physical therapy to a, a style of practice that I just wasn't suited to, mm. or I could just call it. Mm. And I just decided to close the doors and take on a new career and, you know, chalk it up to I'm not what I do, you know. And what what I do is not who I am. Wow. I mean, uh, you make it sound very simple, but I know that I can probably imagine that must have been a really tough choice because having worked in this uh, industry for close to 30 plus years, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we we kind of establish an identity of who we are right. when you work in a specific industry for so long. And to kind of like roll down the shutters one day and mm -hmm. say, you know, I'm going to start doing something else. I mean, that must have taken a lot of inner strength and courage. So what, what gave you the the confidence or what were some of those, uh, what was the decision-making process for you? What, How did you come, come to peace with that choice? Well, you know, I was faced with the reality that the economics of my business no longer operated. Mm. And I tried for two years to reorganize and fiddle on the margins to try and restructure what we were up to. And I actually had deeper insight because I was appointed to the governor's board for the Bree Foundation, which was designed to implement healthcare reform in the state of Washington. So mm -hmm. I'm sitting across the table from the leaders of the insurance industry, the medical directors and directors of the various insurance companies. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually having conversations with them about implementation of healthcare in Washington. Mm. And I just got a really clear picture like it just wasn't going to go well for me mm. as a physical therapist. Mm. I could have, um, I suppose, I could have got, you know, I, what I realized, you either had to be very, very small as a provider or very, very big. Mm. And I just wasn't prepared to sort of go back. 20 years into my practice style and, and sort of have to take on being a sole provider again. Mm. And I just wasn't in a position to go much, much bigger. I tried to sell the business. I lined up a couple of potential buyers. We got deep into negotiations with them. 
and they pulled out at the last minute or they changed the terms that made it untenable. And at a certain point, I, you know, I, I had to like look at what my options actually were. Hmm. And I had no good options, you know, and I'm sort of in my mid fifties thinking, okay, what am I going to do next? You know, cause I, I, I can't see being a practicing physical therapist doing what I do. Hmm. My expertise is in the world of sports science, sports medicine, I'm working with, you know, elite athletes. I'm on the field. I'm, I, I, I traveled with, with the professional rugby team. I'm the guy running on the field with, mm. you know, and I'm getting older. And, mm. you know, so it's just like it was very, very difficult to try and sort of find a niche that paid me what I wanted to get paid mm. after building a career. Right. And I had a friend who was a real estate guy. And mm. he just encouraged me to get my real estate license and get in connection with him. And so I did that. So I got my real estate license and I started doing some residential real estate working one day a week. So I worked one day a week as a physical therapist and five days a week. I mean, I'm sorry, one day a week as a real estate agent and five days a week as a physical therapist. Mm. And over the course of six months, I made about, you know, $80,000 as a real estate agent. And I thought, I'm working one day a week. Yeah. If I worked five days a week at this, I can see like a way to pull out of this. Right, right. And so at that point, you know, it was just, it was just really clear, you know, the, the economics of my business no longer worked. I had, I had a great career. I feel no remorse about my career, you know. I met some of the greatest athletes in the world. I had great successes. I'll tell you a great story about it, like the lightning in a bottle success that I had um, where I took an athlete that had lost her way and I had f- fixed her and she competed the next week in the Diamond League, you know. Wow. And so... You know, I just I just was excellent at what I did, mm. and I had achieved a lot. I'd been lecturing at the university for 25 years. I traveled the world, as you pointed out. I'm, I'm published, all these things. And I just thought it was time to just be done with it. Like it was, a, I had concluded, it was like a closed book, cl- end of chapter. End of chapter. Of you know, and, and I just, I'm totally okay with it. Like I don't have any regrets about that at all. And it was very satisfying to have had that career. Great. That's such a beautiful point that you make. And this is for the benefit of our audience is that oftentimes, <clears throat> you know, uh, we make choices in life and uh, and sometimes we try to want to double down because of the investment we made into a project or uh, a particular endeavor. And uh, sometimes it's good to just take a step back and look at uh, all the options in front of you and then make an informed choice. And I think there's a great book by Seth Godin. He's like considered to be one of the marketing experts. And he's written about the book called The Dip. It's like knowing when to walk away Mm. is one of the key skills of a successful person. Mm. And I think uh, uh, what what you just shared is so inspiring because... Oftentimes, we have to make choices in life, mm. uh, which are difficult choices, and to make those choices in a way that uh, we don't have regrets, mm. that we have to make peace with it, mm. and to find something that is more inspiring and that keeps us going on this track of life. So that's so uh, great, uh, Neil. And that brings up another question. Uh, having traveled the world and having uh, seen the ebb and flow of life, uh, what is your definition now of success? And how would you define greatness? Well, those are really good questions. You know, success for me really is in the world of relationship. You know, what I've what I've come to conclude after all is said and done is like all that there is when you get rid of all the fluff and all the noise, there's just the ability to love somebody. Mm. Right? And so... Like for me, relationship with my family, my kids, my my siblings, like that for me is really sort of at the height of what's important. Mm. And then success is the ability to really be living in the present, a life that you love and a life that inspires you, you know. And so whereas I used to get up at six in the morning and work 12-hour days, six days a week as a physical therapist, like the life I have now I get up in the morning, I take my dog for a walk, I, I work as a commercial real estate broker, in the evening I exercise, I work out, I participate in you know programs like Landmark, 
and sort of get with my friends and family and I play golf and exercise <laughs> and do yoga and really I'm sort of trying to just be present to the day-to-day mm. experience of living I mean, I recognize I have maybe like, you know, 20 good summers left, like maybe. And what I'd like to do is turn 20 good summers into 20 good years Mm -hmm. of summer. And so for me, that's the the context of success is to be able to really just love every moment that we're alive because it's moment to moment, you know. Yeah, I, I like that, what you just said, that success is about relationships and really uh, living a life you love and doing things that you love to do. And and it's really being present, enjoying the present moment. Mm-hmm. And and I think you got more than 20 years, Neil. We'll uh, see. <laughs> uh, you said there were two questions. One was, uh, what is success? And what's your definition of greatness? Of greatness. Hmm. You know, uh, like, for me... Sort of the characters who, who who arise to the level of greatness are the characters like Nelson Mandela, like Mahatma Gandhi, like Martin Luther King. Like those those characters are like great human beings, right? Mm. But I think of the people that I've encountered where they're selfless and they they show up as a contribution for others and they mm. really make a difference for others. Like there's greatness, mm. you know. And sometimes they're not well known; they're yes. not public figures, but they're people who make a difference. I completely agree with that. And uh, being in the community that we are part of, and we come across many individuals like that who have dedicated their lives for the transformation of so many other people. Yeah. And uh, that again is, uh, in my view, I completely agree that it's about contribution and without the accolades uh, right. that normally comes with uh, charity work. Mm. And that's so great. That Not necessarily that. even charity work, but just doing work that makes an impact, that makes a difference. Yes. You know? Um, like we, this culture has a tendency to assign greatness to people who build businesses that make money, like Jeff Bezos or Howard Schultz or whatever. Like that's kind of people look to that as sort of a a measure of greatness. Mm. But you know, like I, I worked with a mountain climber who went up Everest and he brought down more trash than he than he took up. Mm. He made he made a difference. You know what I mean? Yes. Um, like there's no there's no public notification of that. Yes. You know, he he spent his time. He went early and he stayed late and he spent his time in Nepal making an impact on the orphanages. Mm. That that you know that's greatness. I uh, that is just beautifully shared and I I want to kind of reference the project that you were working on during our self-expression and leadership uh, program. Yeah. And uh, why don't you tell us about the B project that you are part of and uh, some of the new projects that you've taken on as part of uh, sure. making a difference for the community. Yeah. Um, you know, the, 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 the introduction to the self-expression leadership program, the instruction is to take on a project that's of importance to you. And I sat this, I sat there scratching my head, like what's important to me, you know, in com- in the context of community. And I just had read recently and had been really present to the fact that the honeybees are under pressure and, you know, no bees, no food. Mm-hmm. So I was like thinking about that a lot. And I had planted a garden and specifically planted it with flowers to attract bees. And I, I, I this was sort of in my consciousness. Mm-hmm. And so I took on a project to somehow impact the declining population of bees. Mm. And I didn't really know how that was going to go. Mm-hmm. And in the world of the self-expression leadership program, I just sort of created community around bees by talking to a bunch of bee nerds mm. and met the bee scientist at the University of Washington and worked with him to try and you know secure the bee science program at the university. And out of that conversation and that experience, which we were successful in at the time, he, so Evan Sudgen and Will Peterman and I created the Wild Bee Foundation. Mm. And the Wild Bee Foundation's structure is organized around the idea that in Western Washington, most of the pollination of most of the plants and crops is actually handled by wild bees. Mm. And of the wild bees, the bumblebees, the heavy lifter, 
And of the bumblebees in western Washington, there are 10 species. And of those 10, only nine remain. And of those nine, four are under pressure. Wow. So we have some work to do. Mm -hmm. and, the, and yet we don't really know what the populations are. Mm. And so the Wild Bee Foundation's sort of larger goal is to impact wild bee population security. Mm -hmm. And in particular, try and get small farmers to use bee-friendly practices mm -hmm. um, to try and increase the number of wild bee populations on their land that are organizing their um, pollination mm -hmm. and be able to support them with rented honeybees when they need crop pollination support. Mm. So anyway, the long and short of it is that at root, we're a basic science organization. The mm. foundation is designed to catalog the pollinators in the fields mm. so that the farmers have an idea who's pollinating their crops and what's available. So that that's an ongoing project. Mm -hmm. And it's 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 it really is the possibility of beauty and abundance. You know, it's it's trying to sort of get at living into a world of abundance. No, I, I that is such a beautiful uh, project that you took on and that was one of the reasons that uh, when I first met you and I heard about your project that really fascinated me because this was uh, such an inspiring way of uh, serving the environment because a lot of people don't consider taking on a bee project. And uh, so having made that difference in our community, I really applaud you for that. And uh, tell us about the next project that you're working on, Neil. So most recently, um, I have a fascination with old cars. I watch those old car shows on TV. And I, I got this idea that I'd like to learn more about how to restore an old car. And so the project I took on was to find a high school shop class, get an old Mustang donated, have them work on it and restore it, have them take it through the auction process so they can learn about that and sell the car at auction and then get the funds back to their high school so that they can increase their available equipment and tools and stuff and have it be like an ongoing annual experience. And so if somebody has an old like 60 to 65 to 72 Mustang somewhere in there, that's like ready for donation, like get in touch. That's what we need. Yeah, and we'll definitely include that in the show notes. That's such yeah. a you know, fantastic project and uh, it kind of like can become self-sustaining in its own right. way. Uh, yeah, that's the idea is to like, keep putting, everybody wins in that project. Like the kids who participate actually learn a new skill so they're they're marketable the high school gets more equipment so they're happy the and, and the shop teacher's job is secure because he's got a project coming in every year and then the kids go through the auction process learn what that's about the person who buys the finished new you know resto mod vehicle has a great new car and everybody wins in the cycle so it's kind of a it's kind of a great project no, well, that's awesome. Uh, so what I'm uh, also curious about, Neil, is we're going to get into uh, a little bit of your hobbies and interests. I know you are uh, an avid golfer and uh, you've traveled to uh, many countries. So my question to you is, uh, what's your favorite place amongst all the countries you've traveled to? And what about this place that uh, fascinates you and you value so much? So I went to Sydney to teach my golf stuff and I sort of got off the plane and I walked around and you know house plants are 40 feet tall and the birds are lots of colors and the fish is plentiful and the people are out playing and I, I called my wife and I said sell everything we're moving I just loved Sydney I just loved it and uh, I could easily like get on a plane and go live there tomorrow it's just beautiful. It is know. beautiful. Uh, my sister, uh, she was in uh, Sydney for many years, and we yeah. visited her. Uh, me and my brother actually took a trip uh, to Sydney. I think it was like three and a half, four years ago, and yeah. it is a beautiful country. I mean, yeah. you know, we visited all the usual touristy spots, and right. actually, that's where I did my first skydiving experience really? at the Blue Mountains <laughs> uh, awesome. on the outskirts of uh, Sydney. Yeah, my, my favorite book, actually, is a Bill Bryson book called In a Sunburned Country about Australia. So it's a fascinating country, you know, and uh, I was interested in it for a lot of different reasons, but mainly because I'm an avid sort of old Navy buff, and I'd I'd read the uh, Patrick O'Brien series mm. 
Um, there's like 17 volumes, you know, and one of them is about their trip to Australia. It was a fascinating trip. And, you know, when, when Australia was a, a prison colony, it mm. just sort of fast, the whole, whole thing is just the sort of history, fascinating. Yeah, the history yeah. is uh, indeed fascinating. And, but, and coming from India too, I mean, uh, we have uh, close ties with Australia and South Africa now because of our cricket, uh, culture and, uh, even England. And, uh, do you play cricket at all? Or? I grew up playing cricket. Mm-hmm. I was an off spin bowler, <laughs> was captain of our cricket team in high school. And I loved it. I loved cricket and I, I pay attention to it a little bit. Uh, I sort of, when I moved here, you know, there wasn't television and there wasn't the internet, and so you you sort of lost a little, sort of lost track of it. Right. But I remember when India played Pakistan in the World Cup, and I was I had a practice in Bellevue, and I had a lot of Indian and Pakistani patients. Uh huh. That was a very a great experience. And I'd go, and these people would be super, super superstitious. You know, like <laughs> if they ate strawberries and the batter got six, they would eat strawberries whenever he batted. You know, because they contributed. <laughs> And I, and I learned that, you know, both in India and Pakistan, that's a very common practice. People believe that they're participating in the performance of their cricket team, you know. It is. It is uh, It is like a religion back in India when, yeah. it come to, when it comes to cricket. And uh, one of the things that I have on my to-do list is to go and watch a test cricket match at Lords, which yeah. is considered to be the mecca of uh, cricket. Yeah, that'd be awesome. I'd go with you. <laughs> we did that together. Oh, that is so great. Yeah. Uh, so moving on, and this is our next segment of our uh uh, conversation, a podcast here, and uh, these are the questions that we have received from our audiences. Okay. And the first question that uh, for you, Neil, is what stops people, in your opinion, from achieving their fullest potential? So I think what stops people from achieving their fullest potential is their fear of succeeding. Um, very often, it takes a choice to move forward in the face of like massive resistance mm. and you you just have to trust your own instincts um i just thinking back to when i started my physical therapy practice i was 23 years old and the the resistance i had from every direction was huge like lots and lots of people were objecting to the fact that at 23 I'd started a private practice mm. and I just like didn't really get phased by their resistance because I had it that I was going to be successful like I just had it that I was and so you know having a plan and then just living into your plan and just like dealing with what comes up when it comes up and not getting phased by setbacks because it's it's really normal when you do something big, that it takes something to get it done. Like if, if, if things that were big were easy, everybody would do big things. Mm. And they're not easy. And, and yet, big things are achieved. Like people do amazing things. But they didn't do those amazing things because they were easy. They, they did them because they were hard and they had a vision to get things done. So I just think, you know, your fear of your own success gets in your way. And if you get stopped, it's not because there's a reason to stop. It's because you stopped yourself. That is so uh, beautifully shared, Neil. And I couldn't agree with you anymore on that because any uh, w- game worth playing or any project worth ta- taking, and we will encounter obstacles and challenges. And I think the self-belief, I think, is what makes the difference between uh, the people who really uh, take on uh, impossible things and achieve it versus people who give up in life. And, right. Uh, and I think what you shared about the self-belief is so critical. Um, thank you for sharing that. Uh, the next question for you is, uh, growing up, who were your mentors? And uh, were there any people like celebrities or any role models that uh, you were inspired by that you wanted to emulate? You know, I was a gymnast. And I was a very serious gymnast. And so what I did was I, I studied the great gymnasts of the world. And I, and I just watched what they did and tried to emulate them. And, and the things they were doing seemed impossible when you just saw them do them, right? They mm-hmm. just seemed impossible. But you had to break it down into smaller steps and learn the basic skills and then develop the technical ability and then the courage to actually take it on. And so, so that experience was really formative for me, you know, because, um, 
in order to to compete at a high level, I had to perform at a high level. And in order to perform at a high level, I had to train a lot, had to practice a lot. Mm -hmm. And when you practice a lot, like the reason they call it practice and not perfect is because you fail a lot in practice. But you have to keep working on it. You have to keep trying to perfect it. And so I had a coach. His name was John Bam. Mm -hmm. And and he, he just kept coaching me, you know. And he just kept coaching the skill that I was learning, whatever it was. And he would learn how to coach the skill because I was, I was actually the highest performing gymnast in the high school. And I was performing at a much higher level than anybody else. And so he had to like stretch himself as a coach to stay with me. But he always was able to put himself into that space where he could keep coaching. And so I think, I think that, um, being impacted by both a vision of what was possible mm -hmm. and then a coach to kind of teach me the skills along the way had me sort of realize that that was available to me in, in, in other areas of my life, not just in the world of sports. That is so inspiring. I think uh, having raising the bar is uh, what I can hear a sense in your uh, sharing there. Uh, this is another question. I know you're, you've been happily married and you have four children. Is that correct? I was happily married till I was divorced. And then, <laughs> so I was happily married for a long time. Yes. And then not married. <laughs> right. But yes, I have four children. They're adults now, 21 through 29. They're awesome human beings. They're uh, inspirational um, leaders in their own way. Um, my daughter's just completing a uh, summer in Thailand, working with a bunch of orphanages there to mm. pull things together in the sort of rural Thailand. And my son Josh, that's my daughter Mia, my son Josh just is back from Brazil where he spent you know, a year working with um, young Brazilian soccer players to learn Brazilian soccer coaching strategies because he's on his way to becoming a professional soccer coach. Oh, wow. And now he's on his way to Spain to go live in Spain and learn Spanish and learn Spanish soccer coaching techniques and take his European professional licenses and grow that way. Um, Quinn is uh, in D.C. He works with Google in D.C. And he's involved in dealing with the U.S. government's relationship to Google on the Google AdWords side. Mm -hmm. And so he's one of the most knowledgeable people in the world of what's happening in healthcare in the country, actually. And then my son Sam is on his way to NYU um, to get his master's degree in coding. He's an artist and a creative young man, and um, he's going to excel in that area, too. Oh, congratulations. It uh, seems yeah. like your children are doing really well for themselves. And, awesome, yeah. And I'm sure they've taken after their father in terms of accomplishing uh, some incredible achievements. Uh, so one of the questions I do have for you is, what is the best book you've read or what, what are some of the books that you've reread or re-gifted to many, many people over the years? And yeah. what would you recommend? So there's a book that, that I read recently called You Squared which is a pamphlet. It's just a sh you know short book, but it's super powerful in letting you reimagine yourself mm. and, and seeing what it would take for you to make a quantum leap in being alive. Mm. Like, you know, a quantum leap is operating at a much higher level of output with no change in energy. Mm. It, has, it takes no energy to make a quantum leap. And the question is, what would, what would take a quantum leap for you to right. perform at a higher level? Right. So U-squared is a really excellent resource and then um i really like the book from good to great you know because it looks at not just the idea that you need to have the right people on the bus for what you're up to but you need to have the right people sitting in the right seat on the bus and so the good to great looks at business over time and they look at what are the practices that make businesses work well you know, and, and how do you how do you distill that down to something that's workable for you in your enterprise, whatever it is? So that's an excellent. No, that's uh, definitely good to great. It's been uh, one of my favorites as well. It's written by Jim Collins, who's a Stanford professor and uh, did a lot of research on companies that have been successful over a certain period of time. And I think yeah. he addresses three questions in that book. It's about, you know, what are you best at in the world? And, uh, you know, what's your economic engine and what are you passionate about? And that becomes your... Uh, zone of genius uh, where those intersect and 
Now that's really fascinating. I think yeah. it's written for corporations, but I think individuals. I think it's can applicable. Yeah, I think it's applicable to a small business. I think it's applicable to you know anything you're taking on. You know, mm. um, and then and then you know I just I I like history. Mm. You know, I like reading biographies and, and autobiographies and like just learning about what you know what people dealt with. You know. And the books that I've been reading this year are are all Bill Bryson's books. They're really they're really great sort of references to who we are at mm-hmm. the moment. The book the book At Home, it's a, it's an amazing history. And then of course his really fabulous book called A Short History of Almost Everything. Mm-hmm. It's fabulous. It's a really great book, and it really gives you a sense like we're sort of lucky to be here, you know, and we're lucky yeah. to be in position we're in, and we get to leverage what we have it's kind of impressive that is uh yes and these are fantastic resources and for the benefit of the audience we'll include that in our show notes uh moving on to uh the second but last section of this uh uh interview and program here neil this is called the rapid fire round and uh where i'm going to ask you a bunch of quick questions okay. and whatever comes to your mind uh the first response okay and uh feel free to elaborate on it if you wanted to okay. but again this is a rapid fire run so neil are you ready i am okay so the first question that comes to mind is who's your favorite historical figure my favorite historical figure is winston churchill mm. uh, the next question what rock star has impressed you uh david gilmore mm, pink floyd pink floyd <laughs> yeah what color what color describes you best blue Hmm. The single most valuable thing you've learned in life. The single most valuable thing I've learned in life is that when all is said and done, all you get to say is I love you. <laughs> I like that. Uh tell me something that is true that almost nobody agrees with you on. Something that is true that almost nobody <laughs> agrees with me on. Um hmm. Wait, that's a difficult question. Um, oh, we can take a pass and we'll come back to it. Let's later. come back to that. Let me think about that one a little bit. Okay, and then the next question is, if you could have any message of your choice on a billboard, what would that be? Make a contribution. Hmm. Whose brain would you like to pick? I would like to pick Barack Obama's brain. Hmm. And if you could be successful in another profession, which would you choose? I'd be an astronaut. Wow. Great. So at this point, I think we have uh, are done with the rapid fire round, unless you have an answer to that question, which is, tell me something that is true that almost nobody agrees with you on. Well, I think Arsenal's the best soccer team in the world. <laughs> <laughs> I would tend to disagree with you because I'm a Manchester United See? fan. <laughs> but uh, no, this has been great. And now we're moving on to our final uh, section of our interview. It's the wrap-up round, the wrap-up section. And so what I'm, uh, the first question for you, Neil, here is, uh, what is your current project that you're passionate about, that you're working on, and what are you looking forward to in the next six months to a year? I'm working uh, with a company called Seattle Land Broker. We create houses in Seattle. Um, we're we're moving from Seattle Land Broker exclusively to opening up Los Angeles Land Broker, and so I'm I'm going to be working on building a call center and a sort of more of an enterprise model for what we're up to, so that we can prospect in both Seattle and LA at the same time. Oh, that's exciting. I wish you all the luck on that project. Uh, So the next question is, what are three things you're grateful for in life today? My health, first of all. Um, Secondly, I'm grateful for the the love that I experience from my children and my family. And I'm really grateful for where we live. You know, people don't realize like just how fortunate we are to live in probably the greatest part of the greatest country in the world. You know, it's beautiful here. Seattle's economy is great. The environment's great. It's going to be the last livable place in the United States as the environment heats up. Mm. So we're really lucky to be here and I just appreciate it. Great. Excellent. So is there anything else that uh, I may not have asked and you would like to share? Well, I'll say this, you know, I have it that we're living in a world of abundance and 
my attitude around abundance is your access to it is found in gratitude. And so if you can experience gratitude in your life in an ongoing sort of way, then then you live in abundance all around you, you know, and, and you have access to that. That is so great. So, uh, Neil, I would like to acknowledge you for a few things here. One of them is that I'm really inspired by your way of being and the way of living, uh, one being that even you are constantly looking at taking your game of life to the next level. The fact that you just recently read uh, the book about uh, U Square and uh, taking a quantum le- uh, leap about your identity and just uh, that's so fascinating and I'm going to definitely check that out. But So that and then your projects that you've taken on, it's so selfless and it's so beautiful and it's so inspiring that uh, you know what you're doing for the community is just uh, phenomenal. So uh, really thank you for that. And finally, for living a life uh, that uh, is uh, really having had so much successes in life and then having gone through the challenges of having to shut down the practice and restart and reignite your career, that's an inspiration for so many people out there who could have lost everything. And then they have this hope now after listening to this uh, interview with you that nothing is impossible. It's about raising the bar. It's about having a vision and going after it. And so really, really thank you for your inspi- inspiration your uh, uh, and taking the time to uh, uh, share your wisdom with us. So one final question, uh, Neil, and this is how we wrap up our interview, and that is why do you think people should listen to the wisdom of friends? So first, thank you for the acknowledgement. I appreciate it. And um, I think that, you know, we go through life and we accumulate experiences and we, as individuals, we create strategies to deal with the world. And in those strategies, there's wisdom, you know. And I think listening to friends and and listening for the wisdom in their words gives you access to something maybe that's new for you, that's, that opens up, that gives you an opportunity for something else. That is so great. So I really, really uh, like that answer, and thank you for saying that. So again, uh, I really appreciated our time and our conversation here uh, this evening, Neil, and uh, for those of us listening, with that, we'll wrap it up. And if you like what you heard, please share. Don't be shy. Thanks for listening to the Wisdom of Friends show with Cal Aras. If you like what you just heard, we hope you'll pass along our web address, theglobalcontribution.com. To your friends and colleagues, be sure to check out our archive section on our website for previous episodes. This has been a Seven Symphonies production. Join us next time for another edition of the Wisdom of Friends.